Will you pray with me, please? Lord, during this season of intentional prayer, looking inward comes upon us this day once more. So we ask that you help us to put aside those things that form barriers between us and you and us and others. Help us to quiet ourselves so that we may be open to hearing your voice above all others. The voice that says, come with me, my beloved, come with me. In the name of Jesus we pray, amen. It is the shortest verse in the Bible, and yet its impact is long and lasting. Jesus wept. I imagine many of us have heard the story in which this verse appears many times. And when that happens, when we hear stories, gospel stories, we think we know well, being repeated one more time, even if we are listening, we tend to tune out most of what is being said. And that's natural, for it takes real effort to fully listen to something or someone we think we already know well. People do it all the time. You think someone's listening to you, they don't hear a word you say. So I want us to clear our minds this morning of distraction and listen with effort to what is happening in this familiar story about Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead and weeping before he does. And I want us to start with the reaction of both Martha and Mary when Jesus finally arrives in Bethany to find out that their brother and his friend, who he loved dearly, dearly, was already dead. Martha and Mary, you know, they knew Jesus, you remember, that the whole family, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, were very good friends of Jesus, and Jesus stayed with them when traveling to and from Jerusalem, you know, quite often. So when they, Martha and Mary, had sent word to Jesus that Lazarus was very ill, they had expected him to come right away. But for reasons that seem unclear to us, he did not. He waited several days. And by the time Jesus did get to Bethany, Lazarus was dead. So when Jesus got there, both Mary and Martha are very upset and say to, say to Jesus, if you had only been here, our brother would not have died. Martha goes even further and says, but I know that even now, God can give you whatever you ask. Hoping right there that Jesus may still be able to do something about the death of Lazarus. Did she actually think Jesus was about to raise her brother from the dead? I don't know. I do think, though, at this moment, we find her grasping at straws, saying things, and, and hoping against hope that, that the whole situation will change. And when it doesn't immediately change, after all, it's been four days by now. She kind of even lashes out a little bit at Jesus for what he allowed to happen. And that's the first thing I want us to hear again today. For isn't that what we often do? have all sorts of wild thoughts when we lose someone or something terrible happens in our lives. When we are grieving for whatever reason, especially in those first few moments or days, don't we often lash out at the people closest to us? I call it misplaced anger. 
when we are angry and upset at someone who really shouldn't be receiving that anger. But they do, because, I don't know, we think they can take it, or they're there, or whatever reason, it happens. I've done it. So both Mary and Martha not only cry out to Jesus, but they both kind of blame him for his death. But they don't run away from him. They don't send him away. In fact, what they do is cling to him. And in their clinging and weeping and crying, the grieving of his own loved ones, Jesus began to cry too. Which is the second and main thing I want us to really hear this morning. When Jesus was confronted with the weeping and crying and emotion of not only his friends, but the entire community that was there, he suddenly became so overwhelmed with his own emotions, moved in his spirit, it says, that when he found himself in that moment, his heart somehow opened wider than it had ever opened before, and he wept. Which, you know, I, <clears throat> weeping is different than crying. You know, we shed tears all the time. We cry all the time. You know, our, our eyes are constantly releasing moisture to keep our eyes moist. You know, tears inside sort of thing. You know, our eyes tear up when irritated by smoke or pollutants or onions. Tears fall. Tears fall when watching movies. Some of us even cry during commercials. <laughs> I know within one second, if I don't change that TV channel, I will be crying when Sarah McLaughlin starts singing in the arms of an angel when ASPCA commercials come on. I am so quick to try to change that channel, and it's never in time. Then, of course, there are times when we cry at just the strangest moments, when nothing seems to be prompting us, but the tears begin to flow anyway. And it is those last two types of tears in which we begin to move from crying as a means of, say, physical defense, dry and irritated eyes, to emotional crying, which we call weeping to mark the difference. So when it says that Jesus wept, it doesn't just mean that he began to cry. He wept, it says. His emotions were taking over him, and he was probably, probably reacting with more than just tears falling down his cheeks. You know, I imagine his shoulders were shaking, his body bending over and shaking, and that he may have even needed had to have been supported by Mary and Martha just as he was supporting them. When it says that Jesus cried out twice when he got to the grave where Lazarus was buried, I don't think necessarily anymore that he was crying out because people were you know, too far away to hear him. I think he was crying out because he was weeping. He was trying to get those words out. His voice breaking. So filled with emotion that everyone around him said, look at that. Listen to Jesus. See how much he loved Lazarus. And it was in that moment when they were looking and listening to Jesus as we should that Jesus showed them and us the depths of God's love for us. His willingness to feel and live 
with us. You know, if God had just wanted to keep repeating himself, I love you, I love you, I love you, as he had done for thousands of years, then Jesus would not have been necessary. You know, God could have just continued to talk to us through prophets and judges and special people like that, and God could have simply continued to send his messages through them, telling us to stop our warring ways, stop trying to control others, wield power over others, take advantage of others. We could have continued to get the message that way and continued to ignore it. But God did not continue to do that. God poured himself right into our lives and came to us in Jesus. Which is another part of the story I want us to really hear this morning. That it's not just that God came to us. He became us. And in doing so, God went from only being up and out there somewhere, talking to people we don't even know, these prophets and things, to being down and in here, talking to each one of us. God could have told us to stop crying. Jesus could have said, don't worry. Everything will be all right, Mary and Martha. But instead, he wept with us. God, through Jesus, could have told us that death was not the end, which he did. But at the same time, he embraces us. God, through Jesus, could have just healed some of the sick and raised some of the dead and dying, which he did. But he also sent others out to do the same. God, in Jesus, could have just remained some great and awesome and otherworldly power, which he still is. But in Jesus... He came and inhabited the world, our world, the one we live in, the one we trudge through every day. And by doing that, he inhabits our lives, knows what it's like to trudge that weary road every day. Every nook and cranny of our lives, God knows. Every moment of great joy, every moment of happiness and expectation, as well as every moment of sorrow. Every moment of relief and every moment of grief. Every moment of clarity of mind, and every moment of confusion. every moment of belief, and every moment of doubt. When Martha said to Jesus, Lord, had you been here, my brother would not have died, she also said, but I know that even now God can do whatever you ask. See, Martha believed, kept her faith, as we like to say. And yet she was still grieving hard, crying, weeping, blaming, was sorry, angry, lost, lonely. I mean, just because she said that and believed it doesn't mean she was simply able to walk away and be happy now that her brother was dead and all would be well. Jesus had finally shown up. 
she still believed that all would be well, that Jesus had finally shown up. But that was only part of what she needed in that moment. What she needed and what Jesus was able to provide was true empathy, true understanding, true friendship, and true love. And Jesus, when he felt those things flowing from him into her and back again, he wept. What an overwhelming thing for him to feel. His body became hers. Her grief became his. And together they stood crying and weeping with one another, drawing others to them to witness this great exchange of, of love. And just for that moment, how long we don't know, but just for a moment in time, words were no longer necessary, explanations and promises seemed frivolous, and the only thing that mattered was one person being with the other, sharing in silence, a silence only broken by the sound of tears. And it was only after that, after the three of them, Mary, Martha, and Jesus, had shared what was needed by all of them the most. Only after that was Jesus able to let them go and go and do what he had orig originally come for, to raise Lazarus from the dead so that everyone would see the glory of God. And so he did. He went and raised Lazarus from the dead, and everyone saw the glory of God. He got to the tomb, called out to this person who had been laying there dead for four days to make a point of telling us that, you know, he was dead. But when he got up, came out, stripped off the cloths that had been binding him, he was finally released from that state, from death, back into life. And in a few days, actually, we'll hear we find them all sharing a meal together, again, in their house. Jesus with Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, there again. Back in the familiar surroundings of the home which they all live, back to sort of how it had been before with Jesus visiting. Remember Martha sitting and listening, or Mary sitting and listening, Martha being all busy in the kitchen, Lazarus, of course, just sort of being Lazarus. He's never singled out for any particular activity except being there as a friend to Jesus. And that, my friends, would be a wonderful place to end this story. Everything back to normal. But even though we're told that weeping only lasts for a night, or this in this case, four nights, and joy comes on the fifth morning for them, Grief and sorrow and weeping and sobbing visited that home again. For Lazarus died again. In fact, he was probably murdered by the same people looking to kill Jesus. You can't have a dead man walking around to show that Jesus was performing a miracle. He, he died again. Grief came back. And Jesus also died. And for two days after that horrible scene of intense pain and suffering when Jesus was whipped and tortured and nailed to the cross and died, it was only after such unbearable sadness do we get to Easter morning and the joy that comes there. And we're told we are to live in that joy forevermore. Bouncing from Easter to Easter, everything is well. And we should. That's exactly what our faith is all about. But our lives don't really go that way, do they?
final thing I want us to hear again this morning is that between those Easter mornings, you are never left alone. For just as you can feel the loving presence of God during moments of joy, like Easter, when we sing and just have a wonderful time together, you can feel that same love and know the same presence of God in those moments of great sadness and sorrow. Even anger, spurred on by sadness and sorrow. And my friends, this is why we do Lent. We know that Easter is coming. It's a fact. We've already lived through it. Yet we are asked now to slow down and see that before we get there, we still must walk in the way that Jesus walked. And when we do that, and follow the way that Jesus went, which is the ultimate thing we should listen for and hear every time we come here, by following Jesus, we need to be moved enough to enter into the pain of the world. The sorrow of others the regret of our lives, and the moments and days and weeks and years that move us beyond crying into the throes of weeping. Joy does come in the morning, but sometimes we just need to sit and wait for the right sunrise to help us get up again. And until we can do that on our own, we need others to sit with us. We need others, and we need to become, and we ourselves need to become the ones who follow Jesus close enough to step into the lives that have been turned upside down by all sorts of things that happen to us. Set explanations aside. Set reasoning aside, you know, we can tell people they're in a better place now and that's fine, but don't leave after saying that. Sit with someone to be the presence of comfort that is needed in all our lives. You know, there's hope. There is hope on the other side of the downside of life. And we must remember that there is a God who does sit with us in our pain, weeps with us, and clings to us, just as we reach out, hoping to cling to him. And in doing so, we hope that we may also do the same for others. Will you pray with me, please? Holy God, we pray today for those who need a loving embrace from the world and from you. We pray that you may guide us to be your presence in the world that can be so unloving and cruel. We pray for those who suffer in war, the infants, the children, the parents, the soldiers following orders, and the zealous seeking revenge. We pray for those who can only watch from a distance and be angry that no one's doing anything. Lord, we pray for those who watch the world, including ourselves, whose attention spans are short and presence of spirit is light. God, we pray that you would lead us into the very footsteps of Jesus that will lead us into the lives of those we can reach and hold and be present for. Help us to embrace, as Jesus did, all of those whose lives are broken by distress. Help us to stand, as Jesus did, with those who live in the face of fear. 
Help us to sit, as Jesus did, with those who suffer pain, body, heart, and soul. Gently touch all of our lives with your spirit, the spirit of your Son, who lives in us today. Amen. Amen. My friends, let us take a moment of silence and sit with God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, sure.